So again, we're going to look at this, this picture that we've now seen many, many times. Down at the bottom right, this is a very, very diverse group. Here it doesn't look that diverse. I want to just keep in mind when we're looking at this, the reason I chose this diagram is not because it represents the actual diversity in the group. It's just laid out well for us because of the way we're dividing up theropods and the other groups. So ornithischians are actually extremely diverse. They would have been diverse for a very long period of time. You've actually already seen members of this group when we were talking about the stegs and the ankylosaurs. I showed you primitive, very, very primitive members of, the, of that group, which were primitive ornithischians, and those groups would also have given rise to these duckbills that we're going to talk about today. So as a result of that, since you know that they are an old group, they certainly evolved in the Triassic, and they were certainly dispersed worldwide. So we have fossils. If you look at this map, you'll notice from your book, right, this is the map from your book, you'll notice that there are lots and lots of fossils from North America and Europe, of course, and also now from Asia. We have far fewer fossils from South America, Africa, and Australia, and of course we have no fossils yet from the far south, but that's just a matter of actually going out and collecting them. We, we're very confident that those fossils will appear, certainly if they're in both Australia and Africa. Uh, we'll eventually find fossils elsewhere. So this group is relatively diverse, but where we're going to know it best is actually from places like North America. We have some of the best collections, and then places like Europe. Those are some of the other great collections for these guys. And these are uh, a group that are at, for, uh, in the most extreme of habitats, as far as we're concerned, from the, from the tropics to the Arctic. Uh, lots and lots of members are found actually in modern-day Alaska, and courtesy of uh, climate change, they are weathering out of rocks faster. So you can go and collect uh, fossil bones if you want. Some rivers actually in the summertime will wash out uh, many, many, many of these uh, ornithopod uh, fossils in the, in the summer as the, the waters melt the, the shoreline. And Alaska, I, will, I know that temperatures are a little different in the past, but Alaska as far as we're concerned when these guys were walking around uh, it was not warm. It was not a warm period in Alaska at that time. It was just warmer than it is now. So the size of these guys goes from very, very small uh, on the order of slightly larger than a chicken. And it would be larger than a chicken to your eye because it would have a big tail coming off the end, right? Not necessarily in the body size. The body size actually may be a little bit or about the same size up to members that reach 15 meters. So this is, that's, that's a big animal. 15 meters is a lot of meat on one, one animal. You can see that here, right here is a human being on the left hand side, and here are some of the larger members within the group. Rem keeping in mind that because fossils are rare, knowing individually the largest member of a group is very, very difficult to do. So 15 meters is probably not the largest any member ever got to. It's just a large size that certainly some of these members got to. I do want to warn you again that we tend to be biased towards large animals, right? We like the big stuff. So of course we know about very, very large animals, but probably a lot of these guys, even in the, in the later portions of the Cretaceous, were relatively small still. So you can't have a lot of big 15 meter long animals in an ecosystem. There's just not enough food there to support large animals like that. You can have a lot of one meter animals by comparison. So probably most of these members would have been on the smaller side, but of course some of these members are truly massive and very impressive in their own right. This is a good example of a primitive member of the group. <clears throat> You've seen a lot of dinosaurs that look like this, and this should come as no surprise at this point. You have an animal that has relatively robust forelimbs, right? And then, of course, is a bipedal organism. And if you look at this animal, uh, you'll notice that it looks, uh, it has things that are clearly designed for herbivory. So it's got those inset cheeks, uh, and it's got those, that nipping beak to pull out plant material. But it also, uh, it, it's, it's clearly an animal that is in transition, right? It's not, a, it's not what, it, what the later members of this group will become, and it's certainly not very large, right? This is an animal you could punt like a little football, so if you ran into it, you would have no problems getting rid of it, and it, it would probably avoid you as a result, right? Th these animals, if you saw them, would act more like what you see with modern squirrels, where they would run away from you, not towards you. And that's, these are probably getting eaten by everybody, right? There's probably lots of these little guys they're running around nibbling on small plants, and then uh, when the, if they get caught, then they'll get consumed relatively quickly. We haven't talked about this yet, and but we will. 
uh, as we get into the theropods, again, I, I am sorry that I have to keep saying we will talk about this, but the actual appearance of these animals is, is being radically altered even as we talk right now uh, because of new fossil finds. So this, this image here is not, uh, it's not bad based on what we would have known before, but it's certainly not, probably not the most up-to-date image we could create for these which is not to say anything about the artist. I, I really appreciate people who spend any amount of time to even draw or attempt to draw an animal after a scientific style. It takes a real talent and a real skill, and it requires you to often be mostly wrong because we're finding out so much all the time. And so if people get into uh, scientific um, uh, drawing and scientific uh, design, I think uh, they deserve to be, to be commended for any type of uh, uh, meaningful uh, addition to the, the field. And this, this certainly has some of those, right? It, the legs are drawn as we think they would have been. And this addition of more color now is probably more characteristic of the group than what we've drawn in the past, right? The green dinosaur or the brown dinosaur. So we talked a little bit about this fossil record, of course, from most of the, uh, from, from uh, most of the continents. And the ones that we don't have it from or we don't have a lot from are, are based just simply on not having gone out there. The group is diverse almost consistently. It is less diverse in the, Jura in the Jurassic than it will be in the Cretaceous. That's probably because some of the niches that it's opening and taking advantage of in the Jurassic excuse me, are filled by sauropods. And not until the Cretaceous do they, uh, they fill the widest niche berth that they will fill uh, during their period of life on, on Earth. A lot of members we have, of course, we have in most cases single specimens or partial single specimens. But in some members, we've actually got everywhere from eggs to adults, so you can actually go out and, and hold eggs with embryos in it, all the way up to the mature adults that have probably died uh, from old age. So, you know, a variety of things like uh, parasites or, or just disease, or maybe simply from uh, other issues. This is not true specifically for this group, uh, not just true specifically for this group, but true for uh, other groups as well. But we do have actually phenomenal numbers of skin impressions. So we, we really have a very good idea of what these animals' uh, skin would have looked like in real life. That's true on larger animals. Smaller animals are more spotty. In some cases, a very few number of cases, we have what are called mummified dinosaurs. These are not actually mummies in the way that you're thinking of where, an, where the actual organic tissue is preserved. Uh, wholesale around the body and just dried and desiccated to protect it, but it is preserved in a molecular sense by the replacement. So it becomes a rock, but it's replaced at a one-to-one, -one, so the organic tissue was replaced, and what the rock looks like is very much what the organic material would have looked like when the animal was alive. And we're going to look at that in some of the pictures that are coming up, uh, but I just want you to know that we do have some, and when you see it, you'll go, that looks like an animal. That really just looks like what a, I would expect a dinosaur to look like. And that's because we have a lot of information of these. And then, of course, actually, we also have these uh, around us. Trackways for these guys are relatively common. As you would expect, an herbivore, especially one that's dominant around the Earth, trackways are present uh, everywhere. And it's very easy to find them. Uh, most members of the group have three toes, which is not terribly different than theropods, but the toes are very rounded. They don't come with those big falcate claws that would be for, for grabbing on and holding on to animals. So they'll have these very noticeable, broad, three-pointed three toes. Uh, trackways once we get out of the very small primitive members, right, as we reduce the number of toes. So here's a trackway. You can certainly go see this. I've seen this trackway. This trackway in this image is actually the direction and then the angle that you would see it if you were standing at it. It, it is um, uh, the floor of sort of a old river stream valley that's been slanted up at about a 60 or 70 degree angle so you can look up at it. And if you could, you could crawl on it. Of course, you're not allowed to crawl on it. But what we can see here, there's lots of different species on this, but there's very obviously large ornithopod trackways right here walking right through. So this is obviously one animal that's traveling along um, in that way. And this is up in, uh, on Dinosaur Ridge in Colorado and the, uh, or in Denver. So if you're ever in Denver uh, for any period of time, you can absolutely go to Dinosaur Ridge. You can walk it. You don't have to pay to go there. Uh, you can park the car and then you walk up the ridge and you can see these very easily. You just walk along. And there's, of course, thousands upon thousands of these. 
they just aren't excavated. So they're just underneath the rock, and there's a few of them where you can actually see them, right? If we were to peel this layer away, there would be another stream bed underneath it, which would have tracks on it most likely. If we peeled that away, there'd probably be another stream bed. So you could peel away many, 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 many tracks, right? Because rivers are roughly in the same location probably for many tens of thousands of years, especially large rivers are probably roughly in the same location. They will move, but they're, they're somewhere similar. And so these guys are walking in similar environments over those many thousand years. It's also other tracks in here, right? If you look, if you were to spend the time here, you would see all sorts of things like little theropod tracks, and that's all sorts of fun stuff. Like the this is only a portion of this is excavated, a very small portion. So just the ones that you see. There's lots of pieces where they're this clearly covered by rock or by plant material, and they are almost certainly there because you can see tracks disappearing into that area, yeah. but no one has excavated those. Uh. It's, yeah, so part of it's natural exposure and part of it is exposure of just certain areas. Part of it is that once you get a lot of tracks, exposing more takes a lot more money and you also have to protect them once you expose them. So most places, if they have a lot exposed already, they'll say, well, that's enough to bring people in and then they'll stop exposing them. And probably rightfully so. Uh, it's hard to make an argument for exposing tens of thousands of tracks because it's hard to do that money-wise, and then what? how much more data are you going to get from lots and lots of tracks? So it's nice to see them, but we don't need to see so many if we want to go and get them at some point. We look at some of the members of this group, of course, the early members, and we saw that as a primitive member within the group was an obligate biped, right? And that, again, is in line with what we think about for uh, primitive dinosaurs. I do want to warn you again, I did mention this when we started, but remember, we think that dinosaurs were obligate bipeds to start, but there is a lot of debate now because the most closely associated dinosaur morphs uh, to, the, to our dinosaur group were actually quadrupeds. Now, they look like they're sort of on-again, off-again quadrupeds in that some of the lineages, the closest lineages are quadrupeds, but some of the lineages just outside of that are bipeds. So it looks like there's a lot of play at this point, back and forth and back and forth. But at least for what we know right now, it seems like a good reasoning to say, yeah, they were really bipeds. As you get up into larger and larger animals, right, by the time you reach something like a 15 meter long animal, you are not gonna be a biped. There's no way. There's just way too much weight to deal with for you to put all of that on your back legs and move efficiently. So to, to, uh, to compensate the animal is brought, the animal, falls forward basically and walks on its hand in those larger cases. And those larger, uh, those animals and certainly the animals in between are probably switching back and forth. So they are sometimes quadrupedal and sometimes bipedal. They're probably going back and forth depending on the situation. It may be because they want to run faster. Uh, for animals that want to run, right, that are not obligate quadrupeds, if they want to run fast, they need to worry about, again, their short forelegs will be shorter than their hind legs. So they want to run really fast. They have to bring those up to the chest and then they will run forward on just two legs as fast as they can. But if they're walking normally, they're probably on all fours. Maybe if they have to reach something up in a treetop, they, they will brace up against it and just use primarily two legs. Certainly the larger sizes are predominantly quadrupedal, if not always. And then juveniles, at least as far as we can tell, always start as uh, bipeds. And then eventually as they get heavier, start to either become quadrupedal or, or they or they do that transitional thing where they can do both quadrupedal and bipedal. And again, we have really good info on juveniles, so it's easy to see that. And we'll talk more about juveniles and juvenile growth when we get into the appearance of dinosaurs because juvenile dinosaurs can look so different um, from adult dinosaurs. <coughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to uh, show you a video. So if you look at this guy, right, so this is a little bit different. Uh, now what you can see here is there, there's that foot, there's that iguanodon-like foot. This is actually an iguanodon-like animal. This is an iguanodon, but it, it belongs to the iguanodontids. Uh, there's that iguanodon, and then here, right there, is that hand. So there's the quadrupedal walking, right, and you can see that in the foot track. So what's happening, this animal is moving at a relatively slow pace. But what it's doing is it's, as it's walking forward, the foot is coming down next to it, and then the, the, and the hand is moving forward, and then the foot is coming down. Compare it to this other one, right? This is not a theropod. This should also be an iguanid. Uh, what you can see is that this one is small and is bipedal. 
So they're switching back and forth, and smaller ones are tending to be bipedal, and these larger animals with so much more bulk are using their hand to help them. No promises on the next slide. It may switch back. Oh, no, we got this one. So this, is, this reconstruction is probably more or less accurate, at least in the way that these animals are walking, at least for normal paces. Like I said, when these animals are moving at different speeds, then different things can happen. So if it needs to run very quickly, of course, that back leg will easily overtake the front arm in the first stride. So the front arm would need to immediately be tucked up to the body. And as soon as you did that, uh, then you would have some issues uh, with the head wanting to tilt forward. So if that were the case, then you'd have to lean back slightly, which would bring the chest up further away from the ground, but would allow you to run. So there's, there are combinational ways to try to think about these guys, right? They're not all or one. These are dynamic animals, and they're making dynamic choices based on the environment they're in. You would be bipedal if something were chasing you. But at some point, you can get so large that the only thing likely to chase you are very, very large theropods, which are going to be very rare. Uh, and you're just not going to deal with that in the same way. So this is probably a fairly good reconstruction of how we think they probably went about most of their day to day. I will warn you that that idea that the hand spike is a defensive weapon is also debatable, right? Inherently, you want to say, well, it's definitely defensive. It's got to be. It looks like a weapon. But it's in the wrong place. It's on the inside of the hand. Right? Why would you put a defensive weapon inside the body? That makes it very difficult. So if a predator comes at you from the side, you have to rotate your hand all the way out to approach it. That doesn't make a lot of sense in some ways. Uh, maybe it's used as a way to break open logs, or maybe it's used uh, in display, or maybe it's used um, for digging or something, or maybe it is used for defense in a very ritualized way, or maybe it is used primarily to prevent uh, uh, attack from other animals. But just having it as, oh, that's defensive, again, is a little bit too easy. This might be a weird question, but is there any, <laughs> is there any proof that that is sort of marking territory? So marking territory is hard to know, right? And uh, dinosaurs are not as keenly aware, probably, of scent as mammals are. Mammals are really, 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 really tightly coupled with it. That doesn't mean that they didn't. Uh, probably they do mark their territory. Modern birds mark territories, but in different ways. Part of it is by singing, so there's vocalization. Also, some of it's by physical display, so they, they stay at a territory border and warn other birds that I'm here. Some of it is by physical, so they, they create some sort of disturbance, and that alerts other birds that there's an animal in the vicinity. So probably, yes, they did, dis they did mark territory. Uh, but how they actually go about doing that would be hard to figure out. These guys also, and, and that the find of them in a herd, right, is probably because that, that was one small herd, or at least a part of it, that was killed on, that, on one day at one time. All of them were buried at once. And then we eventually found them, right? And so they are probably moving together as herds, as you would with most modern mammal animals. And so they're, by and large, this group is probably gregarious. Even the larger animals are probably gregarious to some degree. Uh, but during the breeding season, things may have been very different. OK, so I don't actually know these girls, but I just like the, <laughs> the scale here. And I also like that this one young girl is just completely off in her own world, because that's so classically kid. But the, the image here is a good, uh, good image of how large these animals are, right? This is, this is an adult here. Uh, this is not a particularly large adult. It is one of the larger members, but certainly not the largest. And you can get some idea, right, that you're only, as a human, you're coming up to uh, about the knee or maybe the shoulder in these animals. These are big animals, so they, they are moving and eating a lot of material day to day. And this also is nice because you notice when I showed you that footprint, it didn't look like there were individual fingers, right? You didn't see fingers. And that's because the fingers had fused into basically a hoof, not dissimilar from the hoof that you would see on modern uh, uh, mammals. And again, for the same reason, to provide a large, flat area that's hard to snap or break that can be used to support lots of weight. And so you see that here. And if you look at this mount, which is right at the base of, um, uh, of uh, Dinosaur Ridge, you would see the same thing. The fingers are fused together, probably in the way that they would have been in the live animal. Speed-wise, these guys are probably actually pretty fast. Uh, they may have gotten up to 50 kilometers for the large animal. That's fast. 50 kilometers is a fast animal. You're talking on the order of 30 to 40 miles per hour. Uh, 50 kilometers in a sprint, a dead, a dead sprint. Probably they could, they could maintain uh, speeds of 15 to 20 kilometers. So the, these would have been able easily able to cover enormous distances 
right? 15 to 20 kilometers an hour. That means in a single day, so let's say they do an eight hour day, right? Well, it, with resting and uh, needing to stop to drink or something. And you're doing it at 20 kilometers, you've done 160 kilometers in a day. You're covering a lot of distance pretty quick. 160 kilometers in the order of 10 days, you know, you multiply that by 10, now you've got 1600 kilometers, right? So you're going distances. And that's probably true. These guys were probably uh, going through large distances. That may have especially been true of ones that were in more Arctic conditions. They probably went up there in the summertime to feed, not dissimilar from the way that birds do today, and then probably walked back south during the, the winter time. It just doesn't make a lot of sense for lots of herbivores to stay up there. Some may have, absolutely some may have, but probably some went back and forth, which isn't dissimilar from what we see today. The smallest animals are probably even faster than some of those large guys. 60 kilometers an hour is about a is, is starting to approach what we know ostriches can run at, and they're also bipedal and very good at running. And so 60 kilometers an hour is probably a reasonable speed for, for some of the small guys on a dead sprint. They are, again, probably uh, maintaining uh, speeds in the, in the 20 to maybe 30 kilometer range. In any case, that's way fast. It's really, really quick. So the the other thing I want to point out here, and this again, this this artistic sketch is one I just picked offline, but you can look at some of the things that this person was uh, experimenting with. Of course, these three fingers in front would actually be fused, so you wouldn't have separate. But whether the the finger can actually grasp across the hand, right? What's the point of that finger? Is it to hold things like you see there, where they're actually holding something? Uh, is it to manipulate stuff, or is it to push stuff aside? There, that would be unclear. So. In general, these animals are probably not really good articulators of things in front. Maybe the smaller ones are, but probably not. Uh, they're not really they're not really interested in um, uh, uh, changing the orientation or modifying the orientation of something in front of them. They're probably mostly, by the time they get up to these large quadrupeds, just interested in moving uh, predominantly on these hands. And this artist you've seen has added a little tiny hoof to it and a little what would have probably been a little fat pad to help, uh, and that's probably true. There probably would have been a little bit of a pad there to help uh, distribute some of that weight across the hand instead of directly down the bone. All right, so you have not seen much of the head, although you did see a few of the heads in that image, and I think what you did see is that they are uh, very distinctly chewing heads, right? These are as good or better than the uh, Ceratopsians we saw. Huge numbers of teeth, hugely inset jaws, right? Very, very distinctly inset jaws, so very large teeth. Uh, they have enormous numbers of them, and their location is extensive. And these guys are also very distinct in the way that their head will move. And I, I think in this next, or at least coming up, I have videos of that head moving, so we can actually look at the way in which their head would have, would have moved to allow them to chew more efficiently. In some cases, we're not going to talk too much about it today. I'm just going to let you know that we do have stomach content. Uh, we are going to actually look at the stomach content of an individual in the future. We have an image of that individual coming up. But they have lots of things in them, twigs, berries, coarse plant material, ferns, uh, spores, algae, all sorts of stuff in the gut content we can look at. In general, they look like they're feeding usually on the low to the mid-height plants, which should not surprise you. That's the size they are. They should be feeding on low to mid-height plants. And, of course, they're not going to feed on the tallest plants because what group is going to dominate that? Absolutely, the sauropods are going to dominate those very tallest plants. So they're not going to be chewing on those anyway. Here's a good example of, again, I, wanted, I just wanted you to see this phenomenal amount of teeth and also that very inset jaw. But also, this is what we call a mummified dinosaur. Uh, this, this, again, is not an actual mummy of the dinosaur, but you can really see that the soft tissue here was preserved very distinctly. And there's that hoof up there, right? You see how the hand was kept together even in the preservations. You see that very distinct hoof. If you looked at this specimen, so if you spent the time looking at this, you would actually see muscle striations on this. So you actually see the muscles on this animal. And so we have lots of information about that. In fact, this animal had the skin pulled away from its jaw, so its cheek basically got chewed off. Uh, but then you can see that the skin around the rest of the head was mostly maintained. So that's actually not the best preserved one we have. That would be this guy. And this guy is actually preserved uh, almost to the point where it looks like it's alive to a degree, right? You can actually see the next vertebrae going through here. This is a big pillar of muscle right around the head. There is some of it stripped back over here. All of the internal organs appear to be uh, to have been left in the body. You can see the hand down here in the distinct way it's held. Uh, there's actually skin. If you can look at it down here, you can actually see the skin imprint on the, the legs very distinctly. You can see that on the rest of the animal as well. It's just so obvious down here. But this is sort of the, some of the preservation we get, and that's partially because we have so many of these animals.
This is within the last 10 years. Uh, the other one is much older. No, they had that other one. That they not, not quite at that time. Okay. Not quite at that like time. Keep in mind, it's hard, though. Uh, this is kind of okay. Uh, do we know what the maximum height of vegetation was during the Mesozoic? Sure. What's the maximum height of a large tree that would have lived in the Mesozoic? We have many of them, right? So probably in the order of... of Tens to hundreds of meters, right? These are big trees. Yeah, so we have we have modern trees that have lineages back then, and they are very tall. And that may actually be what we call a ghost of selection path. We haven't talked talked about that yet, uh, but they may be basically evolved to to survive around sauropods. But we don't have sauropods anymore. So it's not like one large tree that killed the whole thing. Yeah, so we still have some of that. Um, is that a pod to be classified? Yeah, that's absolutely what that is. Yep, you can see it straightened out the whole spine. So this is so extensive, right? This is a fairly large animal. This is, in fact, so extensive that it's come into the main yeah. body to help straighten the spine. So by default, this animal will almost always be quadrupedal. It would have to be just because it can no longer bend the spine, basically. And you can see, look at how robust that forelimb is. If you look at the size of this forelimb to the back limb, it's not as large, but it's pretty big. It is a pretty big forelimb. Yeah, so this is a very cool animal. So we, we do have gut content from this guy. These are where the organs would be located, and it's indeterminately, uh, there, there was some damage to the body. It's possible that what happened to this animal actually got bitten by some, maybe even a T-Rex, and then as it died, it fell into the water away from the animal and then drowned. Uh, and so it looks like there's a bite mark on one side of it. So it may have actually died specifically from that event and then been buried so quickly uh, that we actually we collected that uh, material, and that may be why uh, we have it, right? Yeah, so these are very distinct. Yeah, so you get really good feel for, like, how big was the neck around the bone. Pretty big. We talked about this as well, but I do want to reinforce it because I think it's so important. Humans have akinetic skulls, which are skulls that, that don't have bones that physically move. So the bones are locked together and do not move away from each other at any point. Ornithopods actually have bones that move uh, when they're in contact with each other. Human jaws do have a motion, but it, that is a motion within the jaw. Uh, and you have this up and down motion, just up and down on the bones. And then we also have a circular motion on the lower jaw. Ornithopods, which I spelled wrong here, uh, is... A, a jaw which actually rotate out. So let's look at that uh, and they, let's see if we can get a good video of that one. Oh, well usually you have ways to try to prevent that. It's possible to overbite something, but it's hard because jaws often meet some physical barrier to stop that. This is, uh, this is what a dental battery, so you've seen dental batteries, you already saw those in the Ceratopsians. This is another dental battery, again, in line with what you've seen before. In any case, it's rows and rows of teeth, right, as they wear out, another one jumps in. Right, so if you, if you look at weathering on these guys, so in the other groups, we, it depends on what group you're looking at, but you might not see weathering. On these guys, you do see that abrasion, but it's only on the surface of these teeth. So if you found that tooth particularly, it would look unchewed to that degree. But it wouldn't have. It, it just it wouldn't have had a access to chewing power yet, right? But if you find these teeth, you'll see that these top ones, this is half of that tooth that's remaining at that point. So they, d they do get ground down uh, as, they get, as they are used through time. And there's more coming in right below. Yeah, so it depends on what tooth you're looking at. This this surface right here would have been the exposed. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so probably the gum line is there in here, right? Somewhere in here, because as a teeth, you want you want some teeth to emerge. They help to protect uh, your cheeks, right? They pro they actually provide a barrier to the other stuff. Um, so yeah, it's pr the gum line sits down here in the jaw because that's where gum lines are in modern animals probably about that meeting of where the bone and the teeth are. But if you were to break down the bone, of course, you would see that there's lots of teeth underneath it stacked and ready to go up. For us, these guys are relatively intelligent in the sense that they're not stupid, uh, but they're not 
don't think of these things as super intelligent. I just want you to understand that compared to some of the other groups we've looked at, these are smart, but for brainiac animals, these are not where you want to go. Some members have highly enlarged um, optic lobes. That's probably because they spend most of their time at either near or at night. So they're probably spending more time in those areas. And of course, one of the other things uh, that I think is obvious for large animals like this that spend a lot of times in groups is that there must have been some sort of social interaction. So they must have some ability to interact in a social way. So they have to have some amount of intelligence to deal with social settings, right? Uh, that especially once we start to get into these crests and these um, were probably additional pieces to that, right, appearances that would, that would drive those encounters. So let's talk about those crests now that you've looked at them. These are some of the common, I think these are the most common crested ones that people have seen before. These are probably different male to female because we apparently have male and female. Uh, probably males have bigger crests, that's probably the way it's working. In any case, who cares? There appears to be some sexual dimorphism there, and their crests are very distinctly different, right? Really weirdly different, and they have really weird convoluted chambers inside. So if you spend enough time on the internet, you can actually find the sounds that these crests would make, which is easy to do because you can make molds of these crests, then build uh, windpipes and blow air through them, and you can get what are probably the sounds that these guys would have been able to make, right? So you can actually hear extinct animal sounds, which is fairly cool. Uh, but these crests are probably important in that way. They don't seem to be important just for breathing. So they're still being used for breathing, but they're probably useful also for generating sound. So that idea that they're useful for sound and for uh, breathing is, is or that I guess that the idea that they're useful for sound, which is probably what you heard when you were a kid, is probably correct. They probably are very useful for creating lots of sound. And they're very, they appear at least very distinct between species so that suggests that there's some way that for speciation. There are some predictions about these crests, so what, what they were actually used for uh, that Hobson goes through, that Hobson proposed, and that your book goes through in some detail, so we're going to spend some time on it. And he made a number of predictions based around these crests. Each one of these has to be validated for the crest to actually uh, be associated with that speciation mechanic, with that uh, um, uh, sexual selection and uh, sort of idea. In any case, uh, the first one is that communication and display were important, then they should have good hearing and sight, right? If the crests are important to producing sound, if they're important to sexual selection, if they're important for species identification, hadrosaurs by default would have to have good hearing and sight, otherwise you wouldn't need the crest to do those sort of things. So those should be in place. Uh, and then we're also going to walk through these, but I'll come back to this list as we go. So if that's true, then what should we find? Well, we should find things like large eyes. We should find middle and inner ear bones are well-developed, and they should have a fairly wide range of sounds that they can hear, right? Because a lot of those really large uh, chambers are going to produce fairly deep sounds that may not be actually easy for us to hear. And that appears largely true. Uh, hadrosaurs do have relatively large eyes for what we're dealing with. Uh, yeah, we didn't say hadrosaurs at this point. Uh, they do have relatively large eyes for what we're dealing with. They do have fairly large middle uh, and inner ear bones, um, and they do appear to have a wide range of sounds possible. So at least on the, the surface of it, yes, they do appear capable of hearing and seeing each other, and they do appear to be able to hear that and see each other over a range of options. Crests should also be very useful for visual display, right? So obviously very large crests do something for visual display. And therefore, the, the size of and shape of the, the uh, chambers within them should not match the surface. If crests are used for visual display, the chamber within should be distinctly different because the chamber is doing one thing and the crest is doing something else. So they should be disconnected in that way. The crest should function in a very different, uh, different sense. So this appears largely uh, to be the case. There is way, 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 way more complexity uh, than needed for these crest structures. So the complexity within them is much, much high, it's very, very high, but it also doesn't fully utilize the crest uh, in that sense. They're probably using them as display mechanisms as some sort of warning to other animals, either to let them know their physical state or to attract uh, uh, mates to them. Another thing that we'd like to see, of course, is that uh, they should be species specific. That would be really nice, right? If every crest is the same, that suggests something else. Uh, and they should also be sexually dimorphic, right? Some group 
probably the males, should pay a higher cost uh, to have a crest around because they should be attracting the opposite sex. And this, uh, this one appears largely true. Crests do appear uh, fairly species specific and different. They also, and here I've got what are probably a male and probably a female within the same species, but also we also have the adult to the juvenile. So of course, if these are useful in that context of sexual selection, then juveniles absolutely should not invest very heavily in the crest. They should develop precursors to the crest, but they should not spend many resources on it because they need to spend resources on getting larger, not on, on uh, attracting mates or, or learning con species about their status. So these, do, these animals up here uh, do appear to have some differences, right? This is very distinctly different than this individual over here that has a much higher bend to it and the, the length is much longer. Also the little hat over here comes out further. So that one also appears validated within the context. And then one of the things that we'd like it to see uh, if these guys are really useful for social context is uh, crest should become more complex when species overlap, right? So we have lots of species in one area crest should be really, 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 really diverse to help species separate from one another so that they don't confuse one another uh, when, they're, when they're meeting together. And they're, this has not been well tested. There is a little bit of support for this in Dinosaur Provincial Park. The problem for this test is that you need a lot of individuals and you need lots of time periods. So you can look at when an, there's lots of animals and when there's relatively few animals. And you also need to be able to look at uh, and know how many animals are there, right? If you think there are three groups there, but there's actually a hundred, then you'll have no idea what's going on. So this requires a lot of information and is really, really, really hard to test. So I'm gonna put that one in yellow because we're not really sure of that one. And then one of the other things is crest should increase with complexity in deep time, right? Primitive crests when groups are just splitting from one another should be relatively simple. Uh, because initially they're not going to have very much diversity within that. As you get further in time, if the pressure is consistent through time, you should see that complexity continue to be picked up. They should get more and more elaborate crests, uh, and it should become more and more obvious that these are very different. Well, that one doesn't actually seem to be supported. If anything, it looks like it goes the opposite direction. It looks like the more elaborate crests come earlier than some of the more simple crests. So we're not quite sure what's going on with these. Probably they're using the social context, but we're at least concerned about this one that suggests that they may not. So one thing you might want to know is why, 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 why? Why would they not increase with complexity in deep time? Why are they not always getting more and more elaborate and complex? And that answer is maybe multifaceted. When we look at a crest, you see a bone, right? You see the bony element, but it's not all, that's not all that's part of the crest. There's lots of other stuff going on. There's probably colors that are associated it, with it, and there's probably lots of soft tissue that are associated with it. So I just wanna show you this guy. This is an Edmontosaurus. This guy, uh, this was recently, so Edmontosaurus uh, regalis is well known, but this, this uh, little tiny crest added to it was very, very recent. And it turns out that this animal, this is this right here, is the physical shape and appearance of the animal. Without it, ignore the color because we don't know, uh, but the shape of the scales and that kind of thing are very characteristic of what we think the animal would have looked like. For a long time, we drew it without this crest. So you've you've probably seen it like this with those little hat cut off, which is not surprising. Uh, that's because it turns out it was really hard to find the crest. But this individual skull here, which has got clipped off while it was being uh, removed, you'll notice has this large pocket right here. And that pocket turned out to not be a preservational effect. It, fear, it looks like very strongly that that was actually because there was a fleshy crest here that when the sediments collapsed around it, they left an imprint of that crest before it was, it, it was completely lost, right? And so this animal is probably, here's some of the skin right here. You can actually see the neck arcs back. Right, so here's the neck coming around and here's the body. Again, these are we have really, really nicely preserved ornithopods. So if you want to show somebody what a dinosaur would have looked like, you should look at the ornithopods because we've got really nice ones. So here's the actual neckline right there, and then these are the scales coming around. So that is actually probably soft tissue, and it probably would have been soft in the way that a rooster comb is soft. So why aren't crests more complex with time? Well, it could be stuff like a lot of additional soft tissue. Uh, it could be actual fleshy material like a rooster comb. It could be things like keratin, uh, like we see in lots of birds. It could be something else. It could be skin stretched over different membranes. It could be none of those things. We could be completely wrong and the crests aren't useful in the way that we think they are. But I like this one. 
Just because we think we know a species really well doesn't mean that we don't have an opportunity to learn a, real, a lot about it, right? This, this is probably fairly important. And so if these guys had soft, fleshy crests, uh, crests, then probably lots of animals also had soft, fleshy uh, crests that were useful for display function. Again, that really isn't that surprising if you think about roosters uh, and, and chickens in general. They use a lot of those sort of things. Turkeys, a lot of birds use sort of dangling soft tissue material to alert others of, the, of their group. Okay, so just as a review, at least our thir first three predictions appeared largely true. The fourth one we're unsure about, hard to test. And the, right now we may get to test it in the future, but it's hard to test. The fifth one doesn't appear to be supported, but there may be other reasons why that's the case. But we actually need to go and look at that. Okay, so we're going to break here for today. I've already kept you a little bit longer than normal. Uh, but next time we come back, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about breeding of these guys. Okay, so we've talked about hadrosaurs, or I should say we've talked about ornithopods and about duckbills. We're going to talk now about hadrosaurs in particular because we have the most information about them. But rearing and growth, of course, is really important to us, partially because it lets us know a lot about the animals and partially because in a lot of the other groups that we've talked about, we don't have as much information. Maybe that's not as true in some of the ceratopsians. But in these, these uh, later um, ornithopods, we have really good information about growth. So rearing and growth in these guys, at least in the basal lineages and the one that we have information for, that appears to be uh, what we call precocial offspring. So offspring that are m very close to looking like uh, adults when they are first hatched or basically when they first leave the nest. So these are offspring that will uh, probably function independently as adults, are probably laid and not guarded, or if they are guarded, it's only the eggs and then the adult will leave the area. Or if there is some guarding afterwards, it's probably of a relatively small nature and that the adult guards a relative area and the offspring stay within that area. Um, and then at some point the adult or adults leave. So those are precocial. Those are very well-developed offspring. They're able to, to take off and do their own thing. Later groups, and especially you see this with the hadrosaurs, that seems to have switched. Uh, and that we're really dealing with animals that develop what we call attritial offspring. And if, you, if you've done bird work, you've heard these terms thrown back and forth. If you've worked with fish, you've probably also heard these terms. Altricial offspring uh, tend to look much, much more like a, a, young, a young or juvenile for a long period of time. They're underdeveloped when they're born and require some sort of protection, often food, uh, and that's provided by the adult. And that gives the young a chance to grow very rapidly and also to change the shape and size of its body from when it was born to when it's an adult so that they can do things like feed differently or behave differently as a juvenile, which is very useful in many cases because juveniles don't do the same things as adults. And that's especially true for animals that are dealing with very, very large animals, right? So if you're a very small animal when you're born, but you have to get very, very large, when you're very, very small, probably looking exactly like the adult is not going to be particularly helpful because that the reason the adult looks like that is because there are selective pressures based on the size of the body. So you will uh, be under a separate set of selective pressures, and so it is useful to be able to modify that body shape to adjust and accommodate you as you move up. So the larger animals seem to do this altricial one uh, where they have a, apparently extensive amount of parental care, probably from the female, maybe from both parents, um, but there's also probably things like migration, so there seem to be nesting sites. Those are probably not uh, immediately adjacent to food. So the animals are probably arriving at a nesting site for a reason, whether it's, it's relatively distant from uh, things like vegetated or um, mountainous regions where an animal could be, where a, a, a predator could hide, uh, whether that is because the sediments are right for nesting, whether it is geothermal so that the ground stays warm so that they can warm the eggs. There may be lots of reasons, but we know that they use nesting sites over thousands of years because we have nests at different layers, and it's the same species, right? So it must have been over and over and over again that animals of that species came back to that one location, laid eggs, maybe a river overflowed and buried those eggs that year, uh, and then animals came back the next year and the year after and the year after, and then the river overflowed again and buried more eggs, right? And that's how you get those stacked up numbers of eggs. And these colonies are fairly large. They can be many, many uh, hundreds of uh, individuals, maybe even thousands. All right, so this will be the video, assuming I can get this to pause.
Okay, so I just want to highlight this one difference here between you and your, your, your book and my, my lectures here. Uh, in the book, they talk about R strategies and K strategies. Those are useful in Bio 100 when you're discussing uh, different groups and use the epitome of each strategy, right? You'll talk about, oh, we'll talk about a fish that produces tens of thousands of eggs per unit, and we'll talk about an elephant that produces one individual over the course of years. That's fine uh, when you're dealing with sort of the ends of the spectrum, but of course you know that there's a spectrum in between that, right? That uh, there are lots of animals that produce relatively few offspring, but they produce many of them. But maybe they're all individually large. Or there's lots of animals that produce um, lots and lots and lots and lots of offspring, but tons of them and over and over and over and over again. And dinosaurs are more of that category, where they're probably producing a fair number of eggs at one time, producing relatively large offspring, but then they're producing them over and over again because the adults are probably surviving, not a guarantee, but probably surviving. So they're not going to fall cleanly into one strategy or the other. And I just wanted you to be aware that that doesn't mean that suddenly dinosaurs are wildly different. In fact, they're very similar to, uh, to, to many birds that lay lots of eggs. They're not dissimilar in that way. And it's just that we, we often want to put them in simpler boxes. But you're moving out of that realm now since you're moving into higher level biology. And you should expect that the boxes don't really contain everything. They're just useful for understanding a concept. So if you look at, so this is a myosaur reconstruction. This is a growth chart. And we can look at uh, the stuff within the myosaurs, for instance, about how fast they're growing, right? And so you saw that tiny skull, and then you saw the adult. And what wasn't shown in that video, it's shown elsewhere in the, that uh, series, is how they get to those ages. But you can understand that if you're starting at an animal the size of your fist and you're going to end up as an animal larger or as large as an elephant, you're going to need to put on a lot of weight if it's going to be done in any reasonable amount of time. And when you're saying that that animal is getting there in under 10 years, then you're going to need to add a lot of weight. You're going to need to grow really, 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 really fast. And that also suggests something else. That is that small animals are basically all going to die because there's going to be enormous predation on them, right? Because if even one of them were to make it, then they could produce many hundreds of more offspring. And remember, a stable population need only replace two individuals for each breeding pair. So a lot of these animals are going to die. And these animals are going to be, you can see here, sexual maturity is marked by this arrow. And there's probably, skeletal maturity doesn't happen until you're eight or nine years old. And you're really not seeing any animals out past 15. Well, that means if you're sexually mature uh, in your second year of life and you're producing until, say, your 14th or 15th year of life and you're producing one, maybe two clutches a year and you're producing 10 to 30 animals per clutch, you're producing a lot of individuals and only two of them are going to make it on average in your lifespan. So the amount of animals that are going to get consumed uh, in the first year is going to be extremely high. And we see that in things like ostriches, the amount of eggs that are predated upon, the number of chicks that are predated upon. Even making it to the chick stage as an ostrich is an achievement. Making it out of the chick stage to an adult is another achievement. But making it, once you're an adult, you have a fairly stable life expectancy. Uh, for, when we say stable, I think this is somewhat surprising. That, that's still 12% mortality. Uh, when you're up in the 10% mortality, to give you some idea, in World War I, the total population of Europe was declining by 1% to 2%, right? That's, and that's unfathomable for people to think about, the loss of 1% to 2% of all people on the continent. And not to make light of that, because it, it is a terrible tragedy, but that's a very low percentage mortality, 1% to 2%. I'm telling you that when it's stable here, it's like 10%. So 10% of the animals you see are going to be dead by next year. And when it's high, it's up in the 90 percentile. So that... That is more reminiscent of what we see in wild populations where the vast, vast majority of animals just don't make it. But this gives you a relatively interesting rate at which animals are growing, right? Really, really fast growth to sexual maturity, reach sexual maturity early, start to breed, relatively slow but constant growth after that point. And then, unlike birds and unlike mammals, we don't have skeletal maturity until far later in life. And if you make it past that, you continue uh, to reproduce, but you're not really growing that much anymore. It's a little bit different from uh, some of the groups we have today. Okay, so that is going to wrap it up for our ornithischians. So we are now done with this pubis, right? We're gonna, we are done with that whole section, and now we're going to deal with um, the Sorishians.
So we're moving on. So that means we're going to do sauropods. So let's switch over. <laughs> 